So last time we uh, started out with memory management, how to allocate just one integer cell, pass it around between functions. And we saw that even though the function terminates and its scope closes, you can still access the cell that was allocated inside the function, even after you terminate the function. And therefore, it's now the responsibility of other functions in your program to carefully free up that memory when you are done using it. Okay, otherwise, no one will free it up for you. Closing a scope will no longer automatically release the memory to the system. Okay. This space comes from the stack, uh, from the heap. It doesn't come from the stack. So this was the example. Um, we allocate a pointer to an integer uh, called pi. Pi itself is not an integer. When you access it using star pi, then you get an integer. So you can say int star pi equals new int. This allocates four bytes from the system. And thereafter, you can write into the cell pointed to by pi by saying star pi equal to 5. Or you can read that cell by saying star pi. Then you retrieve 5 back again. We can do arithmetic with it just like ordinary variables. You can print both the address and the contents of the address in some expression, as shown in the fourth statement. And the final delete pi returns the four allocated bytes to the system. And you have to do it exactly once. Neither zero times nor more than one time. So the pointer syntax dot pointer variable name. And one important thing is if you are declaring multiple pointer variables, you have to say type name star pa star pb. Okay, it's not the star doesn't bind to the type name, it binds to the variables. So if you keep giving star in front of every variable you declare. Now the next thing we'll see is how to allocate not one cell holding an integer but many cells. And this is essentially the, the same kind of behavior as declaring a native array, except that the native array storage will now come from the heap and not the stack. Okay. So suppose the size of the array you want to allocate is 5. Um, the variable syntax remains the same. It is still an int star pi. This time, instead of saying new int, you say new int with a box bracket and the number of elements you want to allocate. So in this case, because nn is equal to 5, uh, the number of bytes allocated to you will be 5 times 4. So 20 bytes will be allocated to you. And pi will be initialized here to the base address of those 20 bytes. After that, you can access that array pretty much like native arrays. So you can write uh, pi box ix if you want to access the ixth integer in that native array, which is now allocated on the heap. Internally, the expression pi box ix is the same as star pi plus ix. Okay. So let me um, once you know, remind you about the star pi plus ix syntax. So suppose the memory that was allocated to you, 20 bytes, started at address 1000. Let's say. And uh, this was 1020, uh, zero, zero, this location. OK, so now the variable px is equal to 1000. Okay. But remember, px has type int star. It is not a byte star, for example. So which means that, uh, so pi, okay. so pi plus 1 is actually equal to address 1004. Okay. Pi plus 2 is actually equal to 1008. So as you do arithmetic on the pointer, the type of the pointer becomes important. Okay. And when you say star pi plus 2, this refers to the third cell which holds an integer. Okay. So, and this is equivalent as an expression to pi of 2, pi at 2. Okay. So that is the interconvertibility between pointed arithmetic and array index, holds only for native arrays. Um, and finally, that is not so important. If you read someone else's code and you get a little mystified, that is why I am explaining it. For our purposes, there is no good reason why you should write star pi plus ix actually. 
and finally when you are done with that array you should delete it but to indicate to the runtime system that you are actually delete, deleting an array and not one variable you should give those box brackets just like during allocation you gave the box brackets. So the runtime system remembers that you allocated 20 bytes unfortunately there is no language device to ask the runtime system the size of the array you allocated based at pi. So once again you have to remember nn very carefully and it is pretty important that nn does not change by accident once you have allocated the array because then we will lose track of how far you can go starting from pi. Okay. So you have to remember the size of the uh, array you allocated. Okay. So that is uh, how to allocate an array instead of one scalar variable. So in today's lecture we will extend this example to implement our own vector class okay. and the basic strategy will be that we will start off with no backing native array or a very small one and when you push back enough elements then and it overflows our native array we are going to allocate a new native array we are going to copy over the old contents to the proper positions and we are going to add the new elements as specified. After that we are going to delete the older and smaller native array. Okay. When you delete an element you can either be sloppy and hold on to the bigger array or if you find that you have a native array of size 1000 but currently there are only 5 elements in it you might take pity and return most of you know that big array to the system and instead allocate a smaller array while copying the current elements into it. So that is the basic strategy and that is exactly how the vector class is implemented we will just see how to do it on our own. Okay. Then in the second part of today's lecture we will look at linked lists. Vectors have this problem that if you push an element in the beginning or in the middle or you delete an element in the middle then you have to shift all the elements after it one position left or right and that is expensive. Lists do not have that problem in lists you can insert and delete anywhere in the list with constant cost. Okay. The flip side of that is list do not let you index into an element in the middle of the list you always have to iterate through from the beginning or maybe the end to get to any element. So it is a strictly sequential access uh, data structure which you access starting at the beginning and walking up to some point but if you are in an intermediate point you can delete or insert elements there with constant cost. And finally if we have time we will look at binary trees okay, which is another linked data structure where there is a root node and then there is the left subtree and the right subtree and that is recursively defined. So a tree is either empty or it is a root node with a left subtree and a right subtree and then we decide how to insert keys and so on. Okay. So one important thing to note is the so called null pointer the address 0 is not legal. So this is often used to denote an illegal pointer value and uh, I think yesterday I talked a little bit about it. So you can say that uh, you can have a int star pa which is actually 0 but the compiler will complain because 0 is an integer and not a pointer. So you can cast it to int star making it a pointer. Now if you are doing it for classes it is usually customary to declare a static member of the class called null. A static member is one that is shared across all instances of that class all object instances of the class and then you declared null to be equal to the pointer 0 except it is cast to customer star. Okay. Now here is the specification of our own vector class. So the vector class will have a default constructor which will create an empty vector. It will also have a copy constructor which will take another vector and transfer all its elements not move but copy. Okay copy all the elements of the other vector into this vector. It has a destructor which will release the storage associated with this vector. We support the following four other methods. There is an insert method which given a floating value v will insert it at position p in the vector. Now we are free to define the rules of the game because it is our class. If you give a p which is negative that is typically a bug so you should not tolerate that. If p is larger than the current size of the not current capacity but the current size of the vector suppose your current vector has 5 elements and you ask to insert something at offset 10 in this case we might choose to just throw an error or say we cannot do it. Okay. 
you have to you can only insert you know inside or at the end of the array so push back will be allowed by having p equal to the size of the array similarly you can remove um, an element from position p and elements at uh, larger indexes will be squeezed down one position left you can get an element from position p and you can get the size of the current uh, vector which is the number of elements which are actually in it at the moment so observe that the last two methods are marked as const so you declare a method as a const by putting the word const after the function okay um that says that the method get and the method size do not modify the state of the vector in any way it just reads stuff from it it doesn't write into it in any way but of course insert and remove will modify the state of the vector and therefore those are not marked as const yeah so why i can write a method instead when there is a default um so we'll see that because inside the constructor we'll start doing allocation from the heap and that has to be returned to the system in the destructor we'll implement it this is just a declaration this is just a specification which might go into a header file now inside the vector has other private fields which manage its space and operations so we'll need three private fields there will be a native array um so there will be a float star pa which is the pointer to the float buffer that i allocate on the heap so pa is a is a float pointer float star um there will be an int cap which records the number of floats that can fit in the current native array i have allocated if the native array overflows then i have to allocate a new native array and then cap will go up at that point whereas uh, size s i z just for shorthand will record the number of floats that are currently inserted in there so in general there will be this invariant that size is less than equal to cap at all times now if we run out of space then we will allocate a larger array and copy over and maybe if we are generous if size is much less than cap then we will allocate a smaller array copy over and release the larger array okay. so let's look at some of the basic initializers and destructors so here are the private fields of the vector the float pointer pa and cap and size so what does the default constructor do it initializes cap and size equal to 0 and it initializes pa to the null pointer it means that initially i have no buffer allocated now if i'm doing a copy construction from another vector sir if we initialize this cap and size in the private and in public we do in public we don't have to again no it goes into exactly what. the reason i'm doing this is i don't want the user of vector to look at or manipulate pa cap and size that's my territory my only contract with the outside user is those few methods and constructor and destructor okay and nowhere in the signature of the public part of the class will you find any reference to pa cap and size only the implementation of those methods will use pa cap and size so my convention is that when i create an empty vector i set cap and size to be equal to 0 and i set pa to the null pointer so there is no storage to start with on the other hand if i am using a copy constructor and copying the vector from an other vector then i do the following i initialize cap equal to size equal to the other vector size not capacity that's also a choice then i allocate my buffer which is a new float with capacity cap and then for i x equal to 0 through cap which is the same as size i set p a i x to be equal to other dot get i x okay so that copies the array over okay. now one important thing to note here is how the memory management is exactly being done okay. so have a look at uh, this picture so remember earlier when i said main and inside i said point pt okay the space for that point was coming from the stack okay now um and then you know as you kept on declaring it there would be this stack segment which started out at the bottom when main started so if you did pt1 pt2 pt1 would go in here the space for pt1 the space for pt2 would go in there and as you saw each had an x field and a y field 
So, each was taking say 16 bytes if x and y each was a double fine. Now, suppose I go to main and say vector vec1. Question is where does the storage come from? So, now in addition to the stack segment, so this is the stack, I also have a heap segment. The stack has a strict discipline of allocating upwards and freeing downwards by end of scope, but the heap is much more complicated. As you have seen, termination of a function is no guarantee of releasing the memory. So, the heap is a very complicated noodle soup in which some parts of the memory belong to some variable, some other parts belong to some other variable and there is a fairly complex memory manager which takes care of marking which parts of memory you own and which parts you do not and what are free and so on. Okay. So, that is done by the runtime. you do not need to worry about it. But what happens is that when on the stack you declare vector vec1, vec1 has some basic fields called pa, uh, cap and size. Those will go on the stack. But because PA was obtained by allocating using new, PA will point to a segment in heap where the actual elements will be. That is the convention. When you have uh, inside the vector class a float star PA and other native variables like int, cap, etc., these native variables as well as the pointer itself, those will be in the stack what the pointer points to will be on the heap if you have used new to allocate it okay. Anything you allocate using new is on the heap. Huh? What amount of memory is it taking up in the stack? In this case it will be one pointer for PA, one integer for cap, one integer for size. So, cap and size will each take 4 bytes, but what PA will take depends on your architecture and how much RAM you have. This laptop is a 32 bit architecture which means that even pointers are integer like numbers, they are exactly 4 bytes. But newer computers and laptops are all 64 bit machines where an address will take 8 bytes. So, accordingly the size of this base record for vector will be decided. Okay. Now, let us go back to the code. So, one important thing to observe here is that this is called a deep copy. See I could always have just like I am saying cap equal to size equal to other dot size an alternative implementation which is a shallow implementation would say cap equal to other dot cap size equal to other dot size and PA equal to other dot PA. I did not do that right. I actually undertook to allocate new space and copy the elements over one by one. So, the upper strategy is called a shallow copy. Why is it a shallow copy? The actual buffer that is in the heap which PA points to that is not being copied. Only its base address is being copied from the other guy to myself. So, if I did the shallow copy then after the initialization these two vectors would be sharing a buffer with the same elements. Whereas, in case of the deep copy two different buffers would be created in heap ok. So, again just to make this totally clear as a picture. So, let us say here is the heap and I had a vector vec 1 whose say cap was equal to 20, size was equal to 10 and P A pointed to address say 10,000 in the heap and the capacity was 20. So, this was 80 bytes. If I now initialize vector vec2 and I say this is equal to vec1, that invokes the copy constructor. Now, if I write the copy constructor as a shallow one, then my vec2 will end up having again cap equal to 20, size equal to 10, and PA will point at exactly the same place, it will be again 10,000. Whereas, if I implemented it using the deep copy constructor, then vec2 will have 
capacity equal to 10, size equal to 10 according to my implementation in the code and PA will point to some other part of memory, let us say 20,000 with only 40 bytes, but holding exactly the same elements as the first 40 bytes of the source uh, vector. Is this clear? Difference between shallow and deep copy. So there is place for both of them. Sometimes you want shallow copies so that you can share the storage. Sometimes you want deep copies, but in general the standard libraries in C++ and Boost, they all promote deep copy. The safety of deep copying is that you have now separated out the new array from the old one, they are not sharing any data structure and changes you make to VEC uh, 1 after this step will not affect VEC 2 anymore. VEC 2 has been copied off and separated, okay. whereas if you did a shallow copy then any change you make in the old vector will instantly be visible through the new vector as well. Okay. That is a little trickier to code with and that is not the semantics of what happens if you say int a equal to 5, int b equal to a, a equal to 6. In case of primitive variables it is really a copy semantic, it is not a linking semantic unless you explicitly say int ampersand b equal to a then you are creating a linkage. Okay. If you do not give a reference then the assumption is that you are doing a deep copy. Therefore all the libraries we have seen so far has been implemented with deep copy constructors. Ampersand a takes the address of a and turns it into an int star. Yeah, so this is this is a reference, a reference is different from a pointer. So perhaps finally the time has come to hash out the difference between references and pointers. See references cannot be changed, okay. So in the sense that, okay, so this is an important point, let us let might as well dive into it right now, okay. So I say int a equal to 5. Now I can do one of two things, I can either say int star pb equal to address of a and then to access pb I will also always have to use star pb okay. Otherwise suppose I have something like uh, c equal to 8 okay so that now I am free after this point to write pb equal to ampersand c. What happens is that the pointer called pb is now swung away from a and pointing towards c now. This is not allowed if you instead write something like int ampersand r equals a. This makes r an alias name for a and if you now say r equal to c, so if you say r equal to c what will happen is a will become 8 and c will remain 8, okay. Is this clear to everybody? This is very important, okay, the difference between references and pointers. So here only the pointer swings around from A which is still holding 5, C is still holding 8, PB used to be here, it now swung there. Okay. So it means that the pointer variable itself has a state which can be changed. A reference does not have state, a reference is merely a name alias for something. Once you create this name alias for A, when you say R equal to C, you are actually directly poking in, so A and R are now aliases and b is holding 8, this used to hold 5, as soon as you say r equal to c this 5 will be st struck out and you will get 8 in there. So that is the vital difference between pointers and references. <coughs> Can you say pb equal to c? You really cannot, that is a type violation because pb is an int pointed and c is an int. You can force it but you might be sorry, okay. So that is the difference between references and pointers. We are here and uh, so you understand about deep copy and shallow copy. So now let us get to the other method. So size is very simple, you just return size, nothing to do. Um, if you want to get the floating point number at index position p, then you should just return pa of p but after doing some safety checks. So what is the safety check? You want p to be greater than or equal to 0 and you want p to be less than size. You do that by what is called an assert statement. To use an assert statement, you have to include C assert. Okay. After that, if you write this assert statement, assert followed by bracket followed by a Boolean expression. If that expression fails, you will get a controlled crash of your program right there. You will just exit the code with, with an error message printing that this 
assertion has been violated. It's a good defensive coding strategy to paper your code with assertions if you think they must hold at a certain point in the code for correctness. How do you destroy a vector? It is possible that I created a vector and I never really inserted anything in there, so there is no buffer. In which case cap would be equal to 0. If cap is positive, then I will delete PA and I will set cap and size equal to 0. So now the array is gone. We are back in the initial stage. How do we insert? So this is a little more detailed. So I insert at position P the floating point value V. So the uh, technique will basically be this. So if size plus 1 is less than or equal to cap, it means that even after I insert the new element, I will not overflow. Then I go ahead and do the easy stuff. Otherwise, I will have to allocate a new buffer which is larger. In this particular lecture, I will just be sloppy and say we will allocate a buffer which is just one large. Generally, the vector class will allocate something that is a little bit more extra space, so you do not keep on allocating every time. Okay. So here, suppose we allocate a new PA. See, I had this old PA and I want to insert the floating value V at position P. That will stretch my vector out, but I have no space. So I allocate a new PA which is one larger than my current size. Now I create read and write cursors as usual and then the purpose of all these read and write cursors, if you do not want to read the code, it is very easy. The first block is copied over, okay. then the value V is poked in at the right position through the right cursor. Okay. Then the other elements are copied over to the right of the inserted position. Okay. That is it and the only thing to observe later on is that if I actually had an old PA, then I delete it. Otherwise, I set the cap and size to size plus 1, which is the size of the new allocated vector array. And then I finally swing the PA pointer from the deleted space. So once you delete PA, PA becomes meaningless. Okay. So now I set PA to the NPA. Okay. So this is exactly how vector is implemented inside, no magic. So that is how uh, even the code will work. So okay, this is entirely how this thing is working. So no need to do it. And remove I have not implemented yet. You can try it out in a lab. NPA has been copied over into PA. So now you can, you know, you do not need to hang on to it. Yet new PA is lost when you close scope because new PA itself is on the stack. See the what new PA is pointing to is in the heap, but the new PA variable itself is on stack because it is locally declared. So new PA is destroyed when the scope is closed, but the storage allocated through new PA is not. That is now pointed to by PA, perfectly clear. So again as a quick picture, apart from that earlier one, what happened is here was the stack and here was my heap. Earlier PA was pointing to a buffer like this and I decided this was too small. So I allocated NPA which was a larger buffer. I did my copying and manipulation and finally I swung PA over to the same address. So this stuff remains on stack, a new block is allocated on heap and the pointer is swung around. Everyone comfortable with this? So other than this, there is nothing interesting to say about the vector class. So now we will get on to our own Q class. You should delete PA if you actually allocated PA, yes. Okay, so here is the Q class and for simplicity, let us say we have a Q of integers. Now this is for the customer simulation. Instead of using the systems list T, we will write our own Q. And for simplicity, instead of a whole customer record, we'll just think of putting an int in there. You can put anything you want. So the public methods will consist of the following. We'll have a test for emptiness, bool is empty. The test doesn't change the queue, so it's a const method. We can remove the first int at the head of the queue. This will modify the queue. Okay. You shouldn't call remove first if the queue is empty. That's left to the outside user to ensure. Or we can push last, remove first will remove the head of the queue, push last will take this int val and push it to the end of the queue, fine. And finally we can say print the queue, okay. 
Now, uh, inside the queue will be implemented by a different struct called queue element. Okay. And the queue itself will maintain two pointers, one to the first element in the list, one to the last element in the list. Why these two pointers? Because to remove the first, it is good if I have a handle on the first. Why the last? So that we can quickly push back another item onto last. Okay. The system property is that if first is equal to last equal to null, then the queue is empty. Okay. Now what does the queue element look like? So here is a first example of what you might call a recursive data structure. We have seen recursive functions. What is a recursive data structure? The way to talk about it is what is a queue? A queue is either empty or it is a queue element with a pointer to a queue. So this is what a queue element looks like. It has, it is a struct, it has an int value which is back. Okay. In other applications it might be the customer with lots of fields. Okay. And queue element itself has a pointer called next to the next queue element. And we define a one you know, comfort constructor q element with an integer v, where v is stashed into value and next is set to null. This is how we create an isolated node with a value. Okay. But in general, filled out non empty q will probably look like this. So let us look at the heap now. So it is possible that the pointer first okay, has value say 2000. Okay. 2000 is a struct which is a Q element. Okay. So at 2000 starts a Q element with two fields. So the value field is 5. And the next field may be equal to say 1000. Okay. So, what is that 1000? 1000 has another such Q element, maybe its value is equal to 2, and next may be equal to 3000. Okay. At 3000, I might have another such record Q element where the value may be equal to 9 and next will be say equal to 0 which is now. So observe that this 1000 basically links next to that record, this 3000 links next to this record. So logically the Q is a bunch of values which is 5 followed by 2 followed by 9. Okay. Pictorially I might draw it as 5 pointing to 2 pointing to 9 and then it is conventional to give the ground symbol for null or maybe a circle with a the black end circle saying that it is end of the list. Okay. So that is how we pictorially draw this. Observe that there is no correspondence between the linear order here and addresses here. This is a noodle soup I already promised you. So the elements for the list can be coming out of the heap in any arbitrary order. Fine. So it is the addresses which chain them together. So now, how am I going to print out? Suppose I am trying to write write the print routine. Okay. So, in Q, in the class Q, I had void print. So, can you talk about an implementation now of print? Okay. So, I would say that for Q element, I am shortening it for simplicity. Q elements star read cursor equal to uh, first. So I start at first. Okay. While RC is not equal to null, while? while this is a while loop, I mean, this is a for loop. Okay. So for I initialize RC equal to first, while RC is not null, inside what do I do? I print out what? Remember RC is of type Q element. Q element 
has two fields a value and a next okay so star rc is a q element and i can now print its value okay let's say i do that and an endl sorry yeah so the our equivalent of that is rc arrow well that's syntax for star rc dot well and then the important step is what do i have to do after that i have to walk over to the next next element if i am at rc then star rc dot next is the address of the next guy so i'll just set rc equal to that that is equal to hopping from this record to the next record okay or in other syntax you can write rc equal to rc pointer next okay this is the basic traversal step okay so coming back to this picture suppose at some point rc is equal to 2000 rc arrow next or rc star rc dot next is equal to 1000 so if i set uh if i set rc equal to rc dot next that's equivalent to changing the value of rc from 2000 to 1000 and that involves hopping over from the first element to the second element okay so that's how you walk through link data structures you update pointer variables typically from pointer fields in the previous record fine so that's how you walk from link to link or uh, item to item so now let's get back to the so okay so how do i say construct and destroy i told you that empty list means first equal to last equal to null there is nothing in the list how do i destroy i may have this non empty list hanging around with the elements allocated in heap i don't want to keep them hanging around because now i have wasted some memory from heap i need to give it back to the heap how do i do that well first will no longer be useful after this so i can instead of using rc i can just use first itself so while first is not equal to null q element pqe is equal to first okay so what what is happening suppose this is my beginning of the list first with the next pointer to the next element and so on first i create a copy pointer pqe which also points to the first element then i skip first forward so first now diverts from the first element to the second element okay so the first equal to first pointer next arrow next that implements this bypass once it's bypassed now i can delete pqe so pqe along with its next pointer everything goes away so this is one basic step in deallocating and returning the first element of the list to the system and we repeat this while first does not become null okay so how many are clear about how destruction is being done start at first keep walking bypassing freeing bypassing free okay how do we push last remember i already have a handle to the last element okay first of all if the first is null it means the queue is empty then i can just first of all i allocate a new okay so here is the i first allocate a new isolated cell yes ha huh? q double what that's a good point Uh, it was in, uh, even here you are seeing double quotes double colon okay so the idea is that it depends on where you are declaring things exactly like a namespace okay so if you say class foo and then you can define a method okay int method and so on if you implement it right here that's all you need okay if you close the class and you haven't implemented it here but you want to show the implementation here then you have to write int Q colon colon method, and then start the implementation. Here. That holds for constructors as well as other methods and destructors. So here I'm assuming we're out of the scope of the class declaration, so I just put a colon colon in here. So push last. I'm trying to push a value val to the end of the queue. The first thing I do is I allocate a new queue element and pass it val so that I have this isolated cell which is pointed to by PQE. which holds val and points to null again that's what i start with the next thing i need to do which is not shown in the diagram is if first is null then the queue was empty so now first has to point to pqe okay this line is clear right first is equal to null 
in this second statement that is what the fun part is. If last is not equal to null, okay, suppose the queue was not empty, there was already a last element in there, then last pointer next has to be made equal to PQE. Why? Because earlier last pointer next was null by definition. So, this pointer out of last which goes to null has to be diverted to point to PQE. And that is implemented by just overwriting the last pointer next, last arrow next. Finally, what do I have to do? Last has to be equal to PQ. Even if neither of the earlier statements held, now this is the last element, push last. Okay, so, last has to swing from the green element to the yellow element. And PQE as you know is on stack that will go away when I close scope. So, at the end of the push last method then I have restored consistency, a new element with value val has been appended to the list, last has been updated and first and last are now both correct and the previous last is now pointing to this new last. Yeah. It should be also we like yeah. has to be yes, that is done because that is a good point, Q element has a default has a constructor which sets next to null. That is important, otherwise if you put garbage there then your list is completely corrupted. Okay. You have to make sure that all stray pointers are initialized to correct values. Remove first now should be very easy, I am not even going to do a diagram for it because we have already done remove first for destroying the queue. Okay. You just do only do it once. So, the answer is first add a value, then you copy the first pointer value to PQE then you swing first to the second element, then you delete PQE and you return answer. The whole deal with coding with pointers is that the relative ordering between these statements becomes very important. You should not mess up the ordering, okay, in what order you are copying, in what order you are swinging pointers, otherwise things will be buggy. Okay. I had to retrieve the answer here why, because first was copied into PQE and deleted. Therefore, I have to remember the answer in some other variable to return it. Otherwise, after the delete, you could not access first pointer value. Okay. Now, similarly, I should not delete PQE before hopping first over because first itself will become meaningless. See, first and PQE become aliases in this statement. After this, if I delete PQE, even first becomes meaningless. Okay. It is very important uh, to understand where each variable is pointing and not use deleted space. Okay. okay, any questions about this Q class? So, observe that in both deletion and insertion, I was just doing one new or one delete and just swinging around a bunch of pointers. So, the time taken is a constant. I do not care how many elements are there after first in the queue. And last of course, does not matter, pushing back something on last has always been a constant time operation, unless you are reallocating a big vector, but that happens seldom. Any questions on this? So, to summarize our own vector class memory buffer and then our own uh, queue class, we are not allocating a memory buffer for more than one element, each element has a pointer to the next element and we are doing this pointer manipulation to insert and delete things. Hmm. New buffer, yes. Yes, we are doing it, right. So, there is this picture of copying things over like this one. For our vector class. Let's insert. Yes. Talking about the copy, copy. Copy constructor. Yes, that also was shown in the C++ code. So, if you look here, that is our copy constructor. We could either do a shallow copy, which I am not recommending. The style which is consistent with boost and standard C++ is that you allocate this new buffer. You only declared a new buffer and you copied all the elements from the other, other vector over. Yes.
So when you say trying to copy it, you would hmm. want to add those elements over to the your original elements, right? Like vector one, vector two, trying to copy. Content. No, but vector one is empty to start with. This is a copy constructor. This is where vector one is being constructed from nothing. So this is not like you know vector one dot append vector two. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that, that's a perfectly fine thing to want to write. So one method you should support perhaps is. You know that, that would be a public method, right? So, which so I was is thinking like when you try to copy, it, I would think <coughs> appending it in that sense. No, this is just this is a this is the initializer right? that creates a vector. Okay. Otherwise, you have a standard method append const vector and other. Here, you have to do something special. So, in the last part of today's lecture, we will look at binary search trees. So, first of all, what is a binary tree? A binary tree is either empty like before the universe was created or it has a root node with two children called left and right. These children are subtrees, each of which is a binary tree itself. Okay, so just remember these four lines of definition and let me give you some examples of binary tree. So if I take this sheet of paper and say this is a binary tree, yes it is a binary tree, it is an empty binary tree. You could have a binary tree with one node which is the root. This means that both its left and right are null pointers. You could have unbalanced binary trees namely here is a root node with a right child but no left child and the right child in turn may have null pointers for left and right that is a binary tree or you could have balanced binary trees where each internal node is required to have either 0 or 2 children. So, so here is a completely balanced tree with four leaves and these have null pointers for left and right. Okay. So, these are all binary trees. Now, if a binary tree has a key associated with each node say an integer key and for simplicity assume that the same key does not appear twice in the tree ever. It is called a search tree if all keys in the left subtree are smaller than the root strictly and all keys in the right subtree are strictly larger than the root key. So, remember every node has a key. If all keys in the left subtree are smaller than the roots key and all keys in the right subtree are larger than the roots key, it is called a binary search tree. And this does not hold only at the root, it has to hold at every internal node in the tree. Definition is clear. Right? So, yes. So left and right will be three node pointers. So they should be cross-linked also, right? Why cross? In this case, in this case they have to be cross-linked. Right? Why cross? -linked? Because if I pick an element in hmm. in like the bind in the in the array, hmm. it's not in an array. It will be in a, in, in the heap. But we'll look at the implementation. <laughs> let let me get ahead. Of so how do I use a binary search tree from main? So let's set up a specification and use case even before you start implementing. Okay. So, I start off with say a null pointer I declare it just for convenience but you already know how to do nulls. I start out with a tree node star root which is null that is an empty tree. So, the white piece of paper is represented by a null pointer and then in an infinite loop I keep reading the next key to insert. I assume the user will be kind and ensure that all keys are distinct yes. Null is not a keyword in uh, in C++, but then you have to cast it every time. So it's much better to declare null as a static field in every class. So like tree node null. In the new style, what we'll do is we won't need this first statement. Instead, here we would say tree node colon colon null. So this is how a binary search tree may be built. The user will enter keys one after the other. For simplicity let's assume the user will not issue duplicate keys, but the keys may come in an arbitrary order. Okay. Every time I read the key from C in, if the tree is empty then the only thing I can do is root equal to new tree node key. Just like I was declaring Q element with a value, here it is a tree node with a value which is the key. Okay. Otherwise if there is already a root remember root is a pointer and so star root is a tree node. So star root dot insert is the equivalent of root arrow insert. I am going to call an insert method 
at the root node with my new key so that it will be properly inserted in the tree. So let us see an example of how things should be inserted. Suppose in the beginning I have an empty tree. So initially root is equal to now. Okay. Now next to the next step is insert 10. That is the action I want. Because root is null, the only thing that happens is root now points to a node with key 10. And these have null left and right children. If now the next thing I do say is insert 5. Take 5, compare with 10. This is like a railway shunting situation. Since 5 is less than 10, we go down the left branch. Now there is nothing but null, therefore the only thing I can do is insert 5 here with couple of null pointers. Let us say the next action is insert 7. So 7 comes in at the root, finds 10, goes left, finds 5, goes right and that is the end of the road. So 7 is inserted here. It always has to percolate down from the root. At every node it compares the key at the node to itself. You are walking down from the root at any node, if you find that you are larger than the key at that node, go down the right side. But sir, at 10, it found that 7 is greater than 10. 7 is less than 10, so it, I came left. So, it's 12 in the second. Okay, so insert 12. You will not go at 5. No, because I am comparing with 10 and 12 will be inserted right here. For example, suppose the next thing is insert, I do not know, um, 3. Where should 3 go? It should run right down 10 to 5 to 3. Okay. If I now insert 11, where should it go? Larger than 10 but smaller than 12, 11 goes here. Okay. So you see what is going on. This is sort of a approximate way of you know extending something like quick sort. So think of the root as the pivot. Okay. So what is happening is as I insert these things, the tree grows potentially irregularly while always satisfying the invariant that keys in the left subtree of any node are strictly smaller than the key at that node. Keys in the right subtree of any node is are strictly smaller than the key at that node. Okay. Now at any stage if I want to print out the keys of the tree in sorted order, it is not difficult to see how we should do it. We should write a recursive program. So at the root I should first print the left subtree, then I should print the key at the root then I should recursively print the right subtree okay. unless the node is null already then there is nothing to do. So that is the recursive routine for printing things. So there is the insert and then there is the print. So let us look at the definition of the tree node now. So remember every tree node has a key which is an int and it is not easy to change keys in a tree that, that we will not get into that. So let the key be a const, okay, constant. But as you have seen, the left and right subtrees will change as things are inserted. So those are not const. Just like a Q element pointed to the next Q element, a tree node will have two tree node pointers, the left pointer and the right pointer. We have already been drawing it on paper. The constructor takes an underscore key, sets key to underscore key and initializes left equal to right equal to null to make sure those are definite values. And now we have to think about how to insert. I have already demonstrated to you pictorially how insert works. How do you just put it up in code? That is all. The insert method is called at this tree node. Okay, that is one more thing that we need to digest a little more clearly. Tree node is a class. Each actual node in the tree is an instance of this class. It is a different instance of this class. Okay. This method called insert is being called at a specific node. Remember this is always available as the identity of the current node at which insert is being called. Okay. So when you implement insert with n key as the argument, the new key, inside the body of the insert method, you always have available the key value and the left and right value at the current node. So you can always say key and that means the key of the node where you called insert. It is not like key is something like a global variable. Every node has its own key, different key, different left and different right. 
the method definition of insert is shared across all the nodes. Logically, they do the same thing no matter where you are inserting. But the instance on which insert is fired is different depending on what pointer you are invoking insert on. So, suppose I have just entered into the insert method at a particular node this okay, with n key. I compare n key to my key. If n key is less than key, then I should go down the left subtree. If in particular my left subtree is null, then I am done because left will be equal to new tree node of n key. Already seen that. Otherwise, if left is already existent, then all I do is recursively call insert on my left subtree. So, left arrow insert n key. Otherwise, we just repeat all the above using right instead of left. Okay. Now, of course, typing out the code twice, one with, once with left and once with right is a little tedious. Okay. What you mean is find the correct child which could be either left or right and then do the same thing to the correct child. Okay. So, if you have a good understanding of what star and ampersand mean and what is the reference and what is a pointer you can actually code this a little more niftily in half the length. Okay. So, how do you do that? You say tree node star ampersand child. So, you are getting into a little bit of high wire trapeze here. So, what does it mean? It means that child is a reference to a pointer to a tree node. And I set this reference called child to either left or right depending on how n key compares to key. So, note that I am not copying the left or right pointer. So, I am taking a reference to either the left or the right pointer. So, just like my example with integer references a few slides back, when I now say child equal to new tree node n key, I am actually modifying left or right itself child does not have any storage on its own, child is just an alias for either the left or the right at the current node. So, after that the code is exactly the same as before except I do not have to write it twice. If child is null, then I insert a new tree there, node there with n key, otherwise I insert n key into child and that is it. This is the insert routine, it will work fine. How many people are comfortable with how insert is working? First of all, how many people are comfortable with the declaration of tree node? key left right simple stuff insert first cut compare keys go left go right okay second cut using a small trick with pointer references to pointers how do i print the keys so there are multiple traversal orders over the tree the most common one used is in order so you want to print the keys in order therefore it's called in order traversal one word in order so, print is a very simple recursive routine, print at the current node says if left is not null you have to print the left. Then I output the key at this node and then if right is not null then I have to write print the right subtree. So, that star left dot print, see left is a tree node pointer, so star left is a tree node tree node has a print method. Yes, that is right. Yes. So, to, to give another simple example from earlier days. So, if you declared a vector of int vec, you could always say vec dot size, right. So, you are calling a method inside that vector. If now I say something like vector int star p vec, then I should be able to write p vec star p vec dot size which is equivalent to p vec arrow size. Okay. So, any pointer which points to a struct or a class with a certain method, whatever you are calling with a dot earlier. You can still call it to the dot earlier after take you know dereferencing the pointer. A shorthand for that is the pointer arrow the method. 
So therefore, suppose at each three node, I am defining a print method. So print print is not outside the class. Print is actually a method which will be fired at a particular tree node. So what do I have to do if the left subtree is non-empty, not null, then I have to print the left, okay. then I have to print my own key, then I have to print the right subtree. So this is where a recursive data structure is ganged with a recursive function in one to one correspondence. Okay. And you could write printing a list in the same way, to print a list, print the first element, then print the list defined by first pointer next. So how does this work? So the first recursive call will print the left subtree, which is smaller than the root. Then the second recursive call will print the right subtree. And from main, see in this particular case, the print at the current node is not giving a new line. So you say if root not equal to null, then root print, and then you have to print a new line to clean things up a bit. Okay. Uh, so let's look at some sample code. All right, so this is just a direct write up of whatever I was doing and then because I am using recursion I have this indent stuff being included from the parent directory, okay, that is all. So insert as usual I am using that reference trick, so I find the correct child given the key that I have to insert either left or right. What does print do? Again if left is not equal to null do that, I print the key. Now you could either print the key without an indent or you can print with an indent with a recursion level. So at the root the recursion level is 0, otherwise the recursion level will grow. So otherwise I will say print at level plus 1. Okay. So first let me not give the indent and then I define the null somewhere in the code and then what does main do? Main initializes root to null, then while uh, I can still read another key, I uh, insert the key and then after every step. I print the current root with a new line. So it just I am starting with an empty tree, I am inserting keys one by one. After each insertion, I am going to print a tree for you. Okay. Just to separate things out a bit, let me put two new lines. So let me compile this. Okay. So it asks for the next key. So let us go back to our diagram here and insert in that order. I thought we first inserted 10. So I insert 10, the root node is 10, that is the only thing it prints. The next key to insert was 5 in our example. So I insert 5, I print 5, 10. Okay. I next insert 7, observe that these are not sorted order. Third insert was 7, it prints 5, 7, 10. Next was 12. So I can keep dynamically inserting and get things in sorted order. This search tree is very close to how map and multi-map are implemented inside C++. Okay. Maps are sorted, you can always keep inserting things and even deleting things. Deleting is a little non-trivial, you can think about it by yourself if you feel like. Shift the whole branch over. How exactly you have to shift is the important thing. Deleting a leaf is easy, if you delete an internal node then what happens? So in general there is this path coming from the root down to the node you are trying to delete and suppose delete has non-empty left and right subtrees, what should you do? I do not want to, I want to get further in the coding stuff, so but think about this offline, it is a little non-trivial. Okay, so here we just kept on inserting keys and we saw that at every point you can do a in order traversal of the keys. Okay. Um, how do you find the very first key? So in our uh, event simulation experiment we had to keep a map of events with times and always take the smallest event. So you can use this data structure to build that event queue, right. So you can insert an event with a timestamp and that is your key, it will go into the right place in the tree. So how do you get the leftmost leaf in the tree? 
go to L root, as long as left is not equal to null, walk down. Okay. That's your first key. Okay. Now I'll kill this and I'll instead enable the print with the recursion level. Observe that here I am giving a new line at the end of it. So every level will be, uh, will indent to the proper level in the tree and then we'll actually give a new line. That will give us a lot of insight into how the tree looks. So I'll insert in the same order. First I insert 10. 10 is at the root, there is no indentation, 10 is printed at the leftmost position. Next key to be inserted was 5. Okay. So 5 was left of the root. Because left is printed first, it is coming on an upper line. So it is kind of mirror image. 5 is under 10. Okay. Now the next key to be inserted was 7. So 10's left child was 5, whose right child was 7. Okay. If you want to show it the right way around, what do you have to do? In the sprint, you just have to swap left and right. Then you'll get the printout looking like left and right, just turned sideways. What's the next key? It was 12. So see, 10 is the root, its right child is 12, left child is 5, whose right child is 7. But an in order traversal is just like reading line by line. That's always in sorted order. 5, 7, 10, 12. Next key was 3. 10, 10's child was 5, whose children were 3 and 7. 10's child 12 remained as before. Then I inserted 11. And so 10 linking to 5, 5 linking to 3 and 7, 10 linking to 12, linking left to 11. If I insert 20, that fills out the right subtree and so on. Okay. So that is how a binary search tree works. Okay. You could not do this unless you had linked data structures. Maybe you could, but it is a little more difficult. Okay. So any questions about how binary search trees work? So that is how maps are implemented, maps and multi maps. Unordered maps are implemented using hash tables, ordered maps are implemented using binary search trees. Deletion is slightly non-trivial. What happens if I insert in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? So for example, I can now, let me kill this. Insert 1, insert 2, insert 3, insert 4. It just goes down the right spine, right? See, if the tree were balanced, then searching for a key would take roughly log n steps if there are n nodes in the tree because there is a fan out of 2 at every stage and by the time you go down log n levels you get n nodes in the tree. This is a bad tree because I have to go, you know, go down n levels to cover n elements. See searching in a binary tree for a key is very easy, right? It is the exact same as binary search. Given a key to search for, I compare with the root. If it is equal to the root, I am done. If it is less than the root, I recursively search in the left subtree. If it is larger than the root, I recursively search in the right subtree. So that is identical to binary search. But in case of an array, we were always taking the cut at the middle of the array so that we were guaranteed log n time for binary search. Here we are at the mercy of the key insertion order. There is this evil key insertion order which degenerates the tree into a linear chain. And now searching for everything will take linear time instead of taking logarithmic time. Okay. There are much smarter tree insertion mechanisms which always keep the tree balanced while satisfying the left center right property, left root right property. That is highly non-trivial. To dynamically reconfigure the tree in nearly constant time for insertion so that the left root right relationship always remains preserved is not easy. As you know, even a single deletion does not look quite trivial as we speak. So to reorganize the tree to become balanced is non-trivial. If you are interested, look up AVL trees and red black trees. Okay. So CS data structure is rich with dozens of trees, each with its advantages and disadvantages. So if you are interested, you can go explore that further. Okay. 
so what remains of the course you will have one last lecture tomorrow morning uh, yeah okay. so you can also add a parent pointer so so far walking down from the from a parent to a child has been easy but it's sometimes handy to be able to walk up from a child to a parent as well for example if you want to find a sibling okay. that's there's nothing to it you just create another member called up and you fill it up as you insert the thing in the tree so the last comment I would like to make is what's a constant pointer versus pointer to a constant. So anyone who follows uh, American politics will know this very famous speech by Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of State or something, when America was attacking Iraq, uh, saying that uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of weapons, for example. So it's similar to this. What is a constant pointer versus a pointer to a constant? So suppose you want the up pointer to be a constant because the tree never changes. Once it's inserted, it's inserted. Then you have to declare this as tree node star const up. So it's the pointer up whose value cannot be changed. The tree node that it's pointing to can change. Whereas if you say const tree node star up, then that tree node members cannot be changed. And this is not the same. But you could also have const tree node star const up. Okay, and that's like ultimate stasis. Neither the pointer nor its contents can change. Fine. So, of course, you know pointers are a little heavy going. So, what we'll do in the last lecture is spend the first 45 minutes or so doing more examples of pointers and pointer data structures, and then we'll end the um, course with a discussion on input and output from files, from and to files. So, so far when we open an F stream and we read and write you know, from or to it, we are depending on transforming all our program variables into a string form, right. Sometimes you do not want that. Sometimes you want a more compact encoding in on disk, maybe the same size or even smaller than the size that is in RAM. Okay. For example, if you have an integer which is a standard 4 byte integer the number of decimal digits in it can be as large as 10. To write down 10 digits in decimal will cost you 10 bytes of ASCII code, perhaps followed by a new line or a space. So you might take 11 bytes to write down an integer, whereas in memory an integer only costs you 4 bytes. Sometimes this blow up is unacceptable. If you have large amounts of data like the physicists are having at CERN when they are doing collided experiments they are generating petabytes of data per week. So there blowing up 4 bytes to 11 bytes is unacceptable, okay, your budget more than doubles. So we will see how to transcode your in memory variables to disk in the same size. And later on you can explore how to do compression so that you can cram it even smaller than that, but you will not do it in class. Okay. So in particular we will look at a, our own vector class which will actually not be in memory at all, it will actually be backed by a file in the file system. It is of course very slow, but you are no longer bound by memory size. You can now have a vector which is much bigger than your RAM and you can read and write elements to it, you can push back everything. So we will implement a class which is our own vector which we will call disk vector or file vector which will be implemented using a disk file.